ladies and gentlemen, now uh, today I'm going to uh, present my last fifth lecture in series. Today uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the title the high temperature magnetic string 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 of ferromagnetic material. I I suppose you are not familiar with this title because magnetic material uh, the magnet magnetic is normally thought not uh, on very frequently at low temperature magnetic uh, magnetic can affect various properties but at high temperature normally people do not think about such the significant effect but it's not true so magnetism can affect the uh, metallic property even at high temperature as I'm going to show you so <clears throat> today particularly I'd like to focus our the the talk on the magnetic effects on the formation and fracture of course the in connection with the uh, of course the uh, there are many metallurgical phenomena which can be affected the magnetism so but firstly I'd like to show you. Probably you know the deformation mechanism. Which Professor the Ashby proposed the beginning of 1970. So <coughs> deformation, the parameter which we discussed, the deform plastic deformation in metallic or ceramic or many material always temperature and the stress level is the key parameter. So if we plot the, the, the area as function the stress and temperature, we can display what mechanism can operate in the region of specific temperature region or specific stress region like this so for example we see if, if we think about sorry very shaking beyond not point five tm the melting the homologous temperature not point five say uh, beyond this region at high temperature the most of the mechanism can be controlled by diffusion. So in this case, even the dislocation motion is the dominant, sometimes very frequently diffusion controlled dislocation mechanism can be important when we discuss the mechanism of plastic deformation. For example, creep deformation or high temperature plastic deformation like this. So, but I want to show the aspect. In this case, this is in iron. So mechanism, deformation mechanism in iron, sometimes it can change due to the occurrence of phase transfer formation. In case of iron, here is the, the transformation BCC alpha from to FCC alpha about 910 degrees. Here. So here is a, some gap between, from difference in the mechanics or a gap between the across this phase uh, transformation temperature. And also here, so again, there is another phase transfer formation, the FCC gamma to delta BCC in I. So such a phase transformation can affect the high temperature deformation. But students think here about 700 
70 degrees C. As you know, the magnetic phase transformation exists. But uh, in this diagram, there is no indication of such a event. So I wonder, magnetic transformation cannot affect plastic deformation in iron or other ferromagnetic material? So this is the first question. So, uh, however, already early 40s, 1940s, sorry, I did, sorry. Several literature have been pu uh, published. Particularly, for example, in elastic property in ferromagnetic material, including iron, nickel, cobalt, everything. The Professor Kester in Germany reported the very the accumulated the, the, the data and definitely magnetism, magnetic transformation can affect elastic modular in the metallic material. And also, even the plastic deformation at high temperature material, uh, high, temp uh, high temperature in nickel, in this case, published in the Actamate early 1950s, at the Curie temperature, frost rates can change. And also, the Zina pointed out, wrote a very unique paper about the effects of magnetism on phase stability and phase transformation in 1955. So, and then, after that, in 1990s, Professor Ishida and our group also found the effects of ferromagnetism on high temperature free information. I'm going to talk about this. So, definitely, magnetism can affect even the plastic deformation. This is a, one of the demonstrations. If, in the case of creep deformation, we, we, we often determine the creep rate at steady state, secondary state. So, at constant rate, creep the, the proceed. So, if we plot steady state as function of temperature and over T. If there's no effects of some phase transformation or magnetic transformation at 770 degree of the Curie temperature of iron, maybe we can get straight line. And the slope, from the slope, we can determine activation energy for a creep. But as you see, at 700, around 70 degrees, temperature dependence of creep rate change and the creep rate decrease from the extra, extra, extrapolation from the range of paramagnetic region. So there is a decrease of creep rate with decreasing the temperature in ferromagnetic temperature. So this is very similarly correspond the <coughs> diffusion rate temperature uh, dependence of the diffusion rate in pure iron, like this, was reported in just early 90s, just 
1960, published in the Buffington Cohen School, in, published in the Acta Engine. So, this is a similar effect of the ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetism on the liquid And in the same year, 1966, Professor Ishida and the J. E. Dong group, they were the Professor Dong, as you know, the, his group it was leading in the field of creep high temperature deformation at this time. They determined the activation energy of creep by rapid change of deformation temperature by using the uh, direct heating of sample. So if we change just slightly about 12 degrees and then creep rate, of course, change. So by increasing a temperature, creep rate increase. And then decreasing a temperature, creep rate decrease. Like that. Without any change, normally creep rate change like this because primary creep and the steady state we can get the same level at the steady state. But anyway, changing at any strain, uh, strain level at any creep, uh, stage of creep deformation, if we change the temperature like this, from the resultant creep rate, we can determine activation energy of creep. So like this, so activation energy, uh, we can determine like this. This is a 100, 104, like this. Uh, around at this temperature, at this level, the activation energy, 105 kilocalorie per mole, like this. So you can imagine this value is very high compared with self-diffusion in ice. Please me. I see. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, you don't know the. Yeah, I, I see. The plastic deformation maybe there are two kind of plastic deformation depending on the stress condition. One is the, the tensile deformation, ordinary deformation at constant stress or constant load. But in the case of the creep deformation, you keep a constant load or constant stress on the the uh, specimen and just wait and you de uh, determine the strain, amount of strain as function of as function of time. This is the creep deformation. Creep deformation is a time dependent deform plastic deformation. So if you write y and the time so, creep rate deformation normal like this. So, primary stage, secondary stage, secondary, and tertiary stage, which uh, stage, which connects in the fraction. You see? So, this is the at constant then constant or sometimes constant load. This is a critical information. So always time dependent, time dependent plus. Okay. So here we call it steady state because this is the linearly deformed. So we can describe the constant data. Okay? But anyway, in this case, and then, so if we plot the activation by, in the case of the professor, the Ishida's result uh, case, if we plot activation energy for pre as function of temperature, here are the magnetic phase uh, the transformation. So at this point, activation energy drastically shows the peak rate. So definitely 
magnetic, phase, uh, magnetic transformation can affect activation energy or grip deformation. Similar result, not only uh, pure iron, also in 19, since the time we observed such effect, the effects of ferromagnetism, many people were involved in this kind of research. Since the end of the 1960, 1970. So we found so many, uh, we, we collected so many data and the evidence the effects of ferromagnetism on the iron and the ferromagnetic metal and ferromagnetic alloys. But anyway, qualitative explanation like this. What's the origin of the magnetic effect or the high temperature deformation? If ferromagnetic material deformed uh, by the diffusion control mechanism, at the end of the very simply, strain rate can be described like this. Sigma power, uh, the N powers stress dependence and exponential minus QR activation energy of the formation. This is a thermally activated process. But the, if the, this Q is related to the diffusion controlled, maybe this value is very similar to diffusion of atom. So from this value, we can predicts or, or we discuss this mechanism must be the diffusion control. So from this equation, therefore any change in D or sorry diffusion control including this and elastic modulus associated with, with the ferromagnetic Naturally, diffusion controlled plastic deformation can be affected phenomenon. This is a very natural thing. So if we plot the okay, oh, sorry again, this is not so big. If we plot pre plate, we plot as function of 1 over t at constant sigma over e. That means experimentally we change the, the stress level which depending on the temperature, uh, the uh, value of elastic modular at specific testing temperature. And remain this value constant. In this case, we can get such a curve, and now this, from this slope, we can obtain the creep, activation energy of creep, very similar to diffusion of, diffusion of the, in this case, a uh, uh, pure uh, I, like this. So, this means effects of ferromagnetic of elastic modulus and also this gap difference can be related more closely related its effects of ferromagnetism on the future. But what I am I'm going to talk or I want to emphasize today what happened when we alloys another element to the pure iron or any other ferromagnetic model. <coughs> what happened? So, example is I, take, I, I want to take an iron cobalt case or iron molybdenum solid solution alloy without any precipitate. So, in this case, as you see in the case of iron cobalt, here is the curing temperature. So in param 
magnetic temperature region above Curie temperature, you can see the straight line. But below, almost below the Curie temperature, again, Curie plate drastically decrease. Sometimes from the, if, oh, maybe I think more than one order or two order, I'm going to uh, mention, uh, show the data. Very drastic, depending like this. Depending, particularly depending on cobalt. Similarly, in iron molybdenum case, again, almost beyond Curie temperature, pre plate decrease right, strongly. So, this means, as you know, the, most of the ferritic, uh, ferritic steel is used around this range. So, but unfortunately, even at the present time, not many people realize that do, do not know the effects of ferromagnetic uh, on critical information. Yeah, I, I myself very strange, feel very strange. But anyway, there is such fine uh, obtained in early, uh, the end of the 1960s. So, about the 20 years ago, I proposed the new alloy strengthening mechanism called magnetic alloy strengthening. strengthening. Because, as you know, this, already there are several mechanisms as you know, by alloying, strengthening mechanism, solid solution strengthening mechanism, by adding, alloying the different element or solute with a different atomic size, we can expect cotton locking effects on the, diffuse, the dislocation. So that's called the strength. And the second, secondary, in the case of FCC alloy, by adding another element, stacking fault energy can change. So two partial dislocations separate more extensively. That's called Suzuki effect. This is a second source of solid solution strength. And if the solvent shear modulus, shear modulus of solvent is different from solvent, in this case, due to the shear modulus effects of solute, I think pressure model effect we can expect. And also, by putting the particle in the magnet, when this location move in the Slip plane, particle pin the dislocation motion. So particle dispersion strengthening we can get. Also recently, the when the dislocation moved in intermetallics, in this case Ni3Al or iron alumin aluminum uh, intermetallics case, positive temperature dependence of flow stress we can observe. So this is another source of alloy strength. But now I'm, I wanted the fourth case, magnetic strengthening case, just as I mentioned in the case of iron cobalt case. In this case, if you think about size, atomic size, and the shear modulus between the iron and the cobalt, almost the same. Because from periodic table, that's a, just a name. And from the data book, you can easily find shear modulus or the uh, shear moduli and also even the 
the size from the position of the, the uh, periodic table, almost the same. So we cannot expect any existing alloy strings in mechanism. And also, such a strengthening can occur only the, in ferromagnetic temperature. So this strengthening must be the delayed due to the ferromagnetic.
solid rocking can be expected. So probably many of you know in iron, molybdenum is one of the very effective elements to enhance the strength, particularly at high temperature. So in ferritic high temperature material always contain the molybdenum. Of course, sometimes molybdenum carbide is important, but as solid solution state, even the molybdenum play important because of this. So, without any magnetic effects, we can expect alloy strength to some extent. But as you see in ferromagnetic we can observe more significant alloy effect. So in the case of iron molybdenum, we can expect double effects of molybdenum alloy. Ordinary solid solution mechanism by cotton locking and also additional magnetic effect strength. So this is the background of my today's talk and the second one is our most recent one. So I already mentioned that I proposed this mechanism nearly 20 years ago, but still not many people are aware of this effect. Now recently we studied. So to study the effect of the plastic deformation and fracture even at the high temperature. We, in the past, we only studied the deformation, even a fracture. And also, I explained up to now, rather qualitative. So I want to show you the more quantitative evaluation of magnetic strength to reveal the mechanism of magnetic strength, strengthening more clear. And then, for the future, if this mechanism has been well understood, in this case, maybe we extend this application of magnetic strengthening. Not only the metallic material, even the, some kind of ferromagnetic ceramics as well. This is uh, our final goal. So firstly, to quantitatively discuss the effect of ferromagnetism, we have to know the, about the magnetism of the metallic magnet first, pure and alloy. As you know, we already know the very well-known Slater polling curve, which clearly shows the magnetic property of individual, each element and sometimes the alloy. So iron, cobalt, nickel, this is very well known ferromagnetic material. So by alloying the different solvent, how the saturation magnet the Sometimes we call it just a poor magnet. So this means magnetic moment per atom. So this is the poor magnet we call this is new. So that shows the magnitude of strength of element of the one atom. Normally, so iron is maximum around two and the cobalt about 1.7. By alloying the, in the case of iron cobalt, poor magneton, magneton can change the mass. In the case of, for example, iron chromium alloys, which I'm going to talk, in this case, chromium zero, so magneton, uh, magneton zero, and the iron is two. So by alloying the chromium, the Decrease, continuously decrease on the 
point to the straight line. You see? So there is a certain tendency already published in your time. So now we started a two alloy, iron cobalt, iron, uh, iron chromium alloy, iron cobalt alloy, with different the composition. Of course, we have to do the we have to do the mechanical test and also we have to do the green boundary microstructure analysis. But uh, time limitation uh, I do not mention the detail uh, uh, about this. But uh, anyway, firstly I want to show the what tensile deformation behavior. For example, iron chromium, iron cobalt. In ferromagnetic temperature region below the Curie temperature, both alloy, of course, decreasing the testing temperature, flow stress higher, level of the flow stress higher, like this. But in the case of a paramagnetic temperature region, as you can see, the, depending on the temperature, slightly change, is, but not so same. So, and then, again, if we compare the result of iron cobalt, uh, chromium, iron cobalt alloy, changing the composition, chromium content or cobalt content, even at same temperature, as you see, the, with increasing uh, solid content, flow stress increase, as you clearly see like this. But in paramagnetic temperature, below Curie temperature, such an increase is not so significant. So there is a, such a tendency. So if we plot the flow stress, compensates the elastic modulus at testing temperature against the uh, in 1 over T, as you see, Below the Curie temperature, we observed increase in flow stress. Pure metal, this one, and the iron chromium, iron cobalt. So definitely, the temperature dependence can change below the Curie. So, <clears throat> and for example, if some of you are interested in the microstructure in different the of course, during the high temperature deformation, dislocation forms the cell boundary, and then misorientation can change. So cell boundary the affects the dislocation motion. So this is the, the formation of the cell boundary very important. So how cell size can change as a function of stress? Normally, there is a certain relationship of about in almost inverse relationship. With increasing the uh, the stress, cell side is of course dislocation intensity increase at the higher stress level. This is a very natural. Again like this, if this, if we put a dislocation this is sorry this is it. and then uh, against the stress so in ferromagnetic temperature region this location density higher, almost one fold. Because you can easily imagine. Because compared with the paramagnetic temperature region, diffusion rate is lower in the paramagnetic temperature. So recovery effect is not so uh, smaller compared in the paramagnetic. So this as I already showed that uh, below Curie temperature, the diffusion rate drastically decreases. This is the case. Anyway, such a prosperous change of iron chromium, iron cobalt, as function of chromium, our cobalt, always on the ferromagnetic temperature region, such increase of flow stress 
can occur by the test. If, even if we in uh, avoid the such as sorry at paramagnetic temperature region in this case, there is no effect on the strength. Again, this is due to the pheromones. So, how can we we try to quantitatively evaluate the such as the magnetic strength alloy strength? We plot the magnetic moment part for a magnet, as I may already mentioned, of alloy minus pure iron, divided by the pure iron and also compensates by saturation magnetization of specific testing temperature and zero Kelvin like this. So maybe by using this parameter, we can evaluate magnetic strength, magnitude of magnetic strength. And then we can compare with observed value of actually observed increase from this. So if we plot strength parameter, oh sorry, strength ring parameter actually observed from flow stress tank and magnetic fluctuate, this is the magnetic moment of alloys. There's a very nice relationship for iron chromium, iron cobalt alloys, like this. So with increasing magnetic moment of the alloy, we can observe the higher alloy strength. But if we compare the iron chromium, iron cobalt, iron cobalt case is higher level of strength but observed. So now, for finally, I want to introduce you the mechanical or fracture behavior in iron effects of ferromagnetism on fracture behavior at high temperature. Of course, if we do the tensile test, finally the polycrystalline specimen of the alloy fractured like this. So if we plot the elongation at fracture, we can discuss the ductility of our So if we plot a fracture strain as function of a temperature in iron chromium, iron cobalt, in the case of in this guy, iron the cobalt case, as you see, here is the QE temperature. So and this is a uh, low temperature. So <coughs> uh, as you see, the, in the ferromagnetic temperature, fracture strength is larger compared with the paramagnetic temperature. Actually, this is due to the cavitation. When the diffusion becomes more significant compared with the ferromagnetic ferro region, intergranular fracture occurs, as I mentioned yesterday. So the cavitation or crack the, the formation occurs at the level. So the brittleness increases. So, <clears throat> but anyway, at, per, oh sorry, Ferromagnetic temperature region, the fracture strain is larger. So this is very important from engineering point of view. So magnetic strain strengthening can enhance ductility in addition to the strengths. Normally, as you know, the in almost all if we, you increase the strength, strength of material, normally material becomes brittle. So 
or the idea very serious dilemma in material de development always. So if you can develop the strength, strong matches with the material with higher strengths and higher ductility, this is the idea. I mean, not only high temperature or even at low temperature, because we, you can work such a material for a specific shape. Otherwise, even if strength is very high, if you cannot work or deform, you cannot use, very difficult to use, just like a ceramics. So this is a very important. We, we have to get deformability or workability. So anyway, even if we increase the strength of at high temperature in paramagnetic iron, also we can improve the elongation. Anyway, so if we plot, but unfortunately there is such a data we observed. If we plot the work until the fracture occurred from the area of the stress strain curve. This is work which we need to break this material. So that means that if this is the very small, this means fracture occurred very And this is the, the material depending. So if we plot the such a work of fracture as function of Bohr magneton, root Bohr magneton, there is a such a tendency like this. So with increasing uh, Bohr magneton by magnetic alloying, strengthening, ductility tend to decrease, right? There is a subject like this. So iron chromium is better than iron cobalt at room temperature, not high temperature. So we have to solve the this problem. Although we observed, we can, observe the, we can get the nice magnetic alloy strengthening at high temperature, but at low temperature, this is great. So how can we solve? So, as I already mentioned during the last four lectures, my, my final version is application of the When pure if you observe the fracture surface of pure iron, or iron chromium, iron cobalt, as you see, the, in the case of pure iron, fracture occurred ductile manner. Also in iron cobalt, uh, chromium. But in the case of uh, iron cobalt, or fracture occurred the intergranular. So now, now I show, I've already shown that during my second lecture on Glenn Bundle engineer, even nickel aluminite intermetallics, which is very well known, the high temperature, prospective high temperature material. But this material is very brittle at room but because intergranular fracture occurred there, so if we change boundary character distribution, reducing the easy weak boundary, random high energy boundary, up to 30%, 
even at room temperature, we got even yeah, 60 percent elongation without any addition of the problem. But once we anneal this sample, and it, as a result of this, random boundary fraction of random boundary percentage increase almost double, about 70 percent, the ductility disappeared. So definitely by controlling boundary characteristics or reducing weak boundary, we can toughen or ductalize even the nickel iron. There is a possibility, I think. We haven't evidence not yet, but anyway, in the case of magnetic alloy straining alloys, maybe we can improve even the room temperature ductility by room boundary engineering. So this is a uh, open one of the open question, but anyway, there are several open problems for the alloys, uh, the associated the magnetic alloy stressing. We have to study it. Of course, this, as I mentioned, this can be achieved by the grain boundary engineering. But the other thing, the interaction with dislocation with domain work. During the deformation, the dislocation has to exist in domain work. That can be the effect by dislocation. So we are very much interested in such a thing. Very basic knowledge, but we do not know very much about such a thing. And then, as I mentioned, application of magnetic selecting to ceramics is very much interesting for our future. So conclusion this, so magnetic, as you see, magnetic alloy strength is very significant and drastically improve the high temperature strength in thermometer. At least iron and iron alloys. And magnetic, magnitude of magnetic strength is increase with increase of power magnetism of alloy element. So I think maybe you have not been aware of such a uh, mechanism of uh, alloy strength this is not a very popular at the moment, but very important in future development of high temperature magnetism, particularly on the, the iron base. Yeah? So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any question? You know, uh, very much welcome. Even the simple question, I think. Yes. What's the magnitude of the What's the magnitude of the um, magnetic strengthening and what's the mechanism? Uh, story, because, oh yeah, honestly speaking, we are trying to reveal that mechanism. So, of course, gradually, gradually, we came to know that uh, <coughs> the, there is a very close relationship between the more magnet on that and also the uh, magnitude of magnetic alloy strength. So, of course, deformation is due to the dislocation motion, or at low temperature, or at high temperature, diffusion control, also dislocation motion. Because my the first work was the published in 1966, is my first paper as part of my PhD thesis. So I studied mechanism of creep deformation in pure iron or iron. In that case also, dislocation, diffusion control the dislocation also. But in ferromagnetic states, maybe, because as I mentioned lastly, that's the domain wall in ferromagnetic, domain wall exists, and the dislocation have to interact the domain wall, that can be done. But by increasing the magnetic moment by alloying the element, like a cobalt, maybe such the elastic modulus 
can change, as I already mentioned. That means directly affects the dislocation motion, pile of numbers in both circuits. Even though this is a very elementary process of dislocation motion. Also, diffusion can be affected. And so, interaction of the dislocation motion and the domain world rather new topics. Recently, we have been directly observed Glen boundary and the dislocate uh, domain world by the Lorentz microscope or other technique. But anyway, such basic design can to solve this problem. Can the fact that there's the magnetic uh, small wind they work each other because they have magnetic and which can contribute the strength? So are you asking the grain size effects of polycrystal material? No, the size of fat. Because below the temperature, the material becomes paramagnetic. So okay. you can destroy the, the grains, they lock each other because the... Just a minute, just a minute. Please, please, please. I want to clarify because the question. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I cannot answer. Uh, the question is uh, this. This because small grains. Small uh, grain size effects, uh, uh, yes. Um, which carry, uh, uh, carries the magnetism and yeah. the field temperature and they yeah. block each other because uh. the magnetic force. And then which in turn uh, stress the material. Do you think, are you thinking about uh, magnet restriction? Because, you know, uh, of course, and uh, and the uh, magnetic field, the grain shape can change. So the, between the two grains, some deformation or elastic deformation occur because of shape change. That we call the magnetostriction. But the, the, I don't understand what kind of interaction are you expecting? I don't know. Mm, it's a very simple question, it's very important, I think, but anyway. Well, I guess, we, uh, obviously, you, she was lots of evidence mm. that uh, the steel is being strengthened up against the pure temperature, mm -hmm. the paramagnetic. That's right. I guess, probably because the, the grains uh, in the material mm. they, they arrange in a certain direction because of, of course, of course. Then, which they lock each other. Mm. Material. And also, there's you mentioned the dislocation. Mm. But they, of course, but uh, in polycrystal material, grain orientation can vary in three dimensions. You see? Yeah, That's a random. In that case, the, it's the whole material is not ferromagnetism. Oh, yes, even the ferromagnetism. So the spin, you know, because you know, normally in the orientation can vary from the grain to grain. So random orientation distribution can possible, can, uh, the, it's possible. But uh, if we, let's say, polypetal material has a very sharp texture, in that case, green, grain orientation aligned to some certain direction, See, like a uh, similarly to single crystal. But uh, still, boundary can be. In that case, behavior can be a bit different from random polycrystal. But anyway, you are questioning the very basic, but I think that we have to clarify what the point you want to. Yes? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned the magnetic strength use actually the magnetic elbow. I just wondered. Uh, what happens if we put uh, external electric uh, magnetic field yes. when you do the processing? I see. That's a really good question. Again, we are very much internet because recently we are doing grain uh, boundary engineering by magnetic field application. So this is the, uh, actually our base. So now we are very much interested in how to control the grain boundary microstructure to produce a desirable property, high temperature property as well, fracture property as well, like that, by 
considering the interaction between brain boundary and domain wall, as I mentioned. So this is a, our future project, or other people. I very much expect the other researcher, or particularly young researcher, for the future, as the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.